Welcome to part 14, running the jet job on my version of the Burlington Northern in 1973. This is Burr Stewart, your host, and I'll start with a quick briefing on the jet job, and then we'll get right down to running it. During the 1970s, which I model, the Boeing company was very busy manufacturing 747s, and it took up to 18 carloads of assemblies and parts for them to manufacture one 747. So it's very important to me to model this traffic on my railroad, which simulates the Burlington Northern Main Line between Bellingham and Seattle, Washington. Here's a map of the geography of the United States. The Boeing plant is located in the upper left-hand corner of the country in Washington State, near Everett. Here's a blow-up of the state of Washington, and the plant is just south of Everett and north of Edmonds. I've simplified the railroad layout here. The Boeing plant, as I said, was located right near Everett, and there was a special branch line that went up to the plant, which was up on a hill. And there was also a Boeing plant in Renton, uh, down in South Seattle, which had a branch job to serve it as well. The Everett plant train was called the Jet Job, and the Renton train was called the Renton Rocket. But all of that is beyond the scope of today. The Boeing Everett plant was supported by sub-assembly manufacturing in Kansas at Boeing Wichita, which eventually became Spirit Aerosystems, the Northrop Corporation down in Los Angeles, and Canadian firms. I think I made up Hawker Sidley being the firm, but uh, there were some subcontractors from Canada. So the skybox cars, as we call them, or the Boeing tool cars, as the railroad employees call them, would come from all three directions to the Boeing plant in Everett that made the 747s. So the rest of this video is my simulation of that jet job. There were also movements in the other direction out of the plant of scrap aluminum back to Alcoa, Tennessee, where they made the specialty aluminum used in airplanes. The exciting thing about the Boeing Everett plant was the 5% grade, but I don't have room to model that yet on my layout. Of course, the real railroad is much more complicated than this. Even my model railroad is. Here on the top, you can see, using the fork method of track planning, the overall series of yards. And then on the bottom is a simplified color diagram, now, just to indicate that the eastbound cars come in to the delta yard, and they have to be transferred over to the bayside yard. The northbound cars come in directly, as well as the southbound to the Bayside Yard, and then this jet job simply takes all the cars up to the Boeing plant from Bayside to Muckleteo and backs in to the spur with a 5% uphill grade to the Boeing plant. Here's a view of the prototype Boeing spur entering the main line southbound. And here's my model of it with the engine poking out. So let's get on with it and run this jet job. At the throttle today is Todd Von Stoop, and he's going to stop the train so that he can have a brakeman get out and flip that switch. In this case, his right hand. Two toots means we're moving forward, folks. Of course, uh, even to get this far, he would have had to contact the dispatcher for clearance to occupy the northbound main line. Not to mention wiping off his forehead after that long downhill 5.5% grade where he was hoping he wouldn't lose control of his train. You can hear the clicking in that caboose. It's one of the new Atherin Genesis sound cabooses. And we're using it on today's train because it needs to run for about six miles caboose first, and we want to use the whistle in the caboose to blow for grade crossings. Now Todd's checking the waybills for the train, and you notice some purple and blue. The purple is eastbound cars, blue is northbound. That'll all be taken care of once we get to Bayside.
It's not every day you get to run a legitimate train caboose first, so we'll show you a couple of different camera angles on this. I asked some railroad men that I know, why didn't they run this train engine first? The answer is that it was never all that long, and it was a lot easier to just shove it back with the caboose since they were only going six miles. Sounds like we have a squeaky journal box. That 57 Chevy at the grade crossing is in honor of my uncle who used to drive one. These skybox cars were produced by LBF Company about 25 years ago. And I can't tell you about the box cars whether they contained scrap or they were going back empty. This GP9 number 1799 was one of three Jeeps that the Great Northern originally equipped with fancy brakes and sumps in order to climb that grade. I guess I'll have to figure out how to rewire the marker light so you can see it. This section of the main line approaching Bayside Yard from the south is called the low line. We have some friends over while we're running this, so you'll enjoy the chatter in the background that's typical of our operating sessions. Having traveled the six miles from Muckleteo up to Everett's Bayside Yard, we're now pulling into the yard lead to see what the Bayside Yardmaster has for us. Well, it looks like before we can do anything else, we have to wait for the Pacific Zip to fly by. This was BN's first intermodal cross-country train, and we'll cover it later in a different video. Yeah, we were right. just through the freaking Montana. Oh, we stayed in Missoula and went down oh, yeah. to that, their home office. Yeah, there. yeah, you know, the dispatchers that there. Old, yeah, yeah. yeah that old a, building is very cool. Yeah. Yeah, I love it down there. Yeah. yeah. Now that that fuss is over, we can get back to work. Rotating beacon. What number is that? Six. Six. Is it gone? Yep. All right. First, we're going to drop the caboose off temporarily. Then we'll shove our train onto track two. And having done that, we'll then pull our cars from track three that need to go back to the Boeing plant on our return trip. That one toot tells the crew that we've come to a stop and it's safe to uncouple. Uh 
Oh, we're going to have another wreck with the plutonium train. This thing is like a... <laughs> Looks like we have to fuss with the caboose yes, in order to let another train right pass. There. I'll stop it. There you go. You can go Don't through. stop it. It's the, the uh, least reliable train on the railroad. It <laughs> is. Here, Todd, yeah. just put it against the uh, engine. Reason like being, that. who wants to run it? Yeah, just yeah. go ahead and proceed because okay. that's du dual action. All right. This approaching train is a fictitious Penn Central plutonium special. Very dangerous for everyone involved. Although it appears empty, which is probably a good thing. Oh, number four. That's it. Just in time. This BN Jeep is an Athern Genesis product with one of the original oh, Tsunami God. decoders in it. Yep. One day I'll change it out for a Tsunami 2, but it, it still runs really well. I always remap the CVs in the decoders so that I can have the headlights stay on regardless of the direction of the locomotive. I also set the brake function so it's activated on F9. And you'll notice Todd using the brake, he'll, he'll spool up the throttle and then release the brake, which is something that's often done by prototype railroad engineers. Well, now we've dropped our cars off, so we're heading into track three to pick up the new ones. Before the yeah. session on the seventh. Yeah. Okay. Looks like Todd grabbed too many cars, so he's going to uncouple the back of those three skybox cars. Yeah. Yeah. No. One thing I was going to say about the in-person that I just noticed is like when you're remote, you can't really tell how fast you're going. You know, and that's where the conductor and engineer team should be able to slow down, speed up. Um, you, you really you can't see the train all the time, ah. and that's where I think the pairs are going to work for us. Okay. So, all, right. all right. I'll see you next time. See you, Tom. Thanks, Burr. Yep. Well, now all we need to do is pick up our caboose, and we'll be ready to head back to the Boeing plant. In the real world, we probably would have waited for an air test, but we get in a hurry on model railroads.
our train back together, we head south towards Mukilteo. We call this the Squid Bridge. I'm not sure how that squid got there, but once you start a tradition like that, it's hard to stop. This normally should be a great northern caboose with BN lettering, but when Atherin Genesis came out with the sound car and the Burlington caboose, I went with that initially until I can get around with installing a sound decoder in one of my GN cabooses. Peaceful, isn't it? Well, now we can go through that grade crossing engine first. I never get tired of looking at a GP9, do you? Well, we've been on the right-hand main, but in order to get into the jet plant, we have to cross over to the left-hand main. So Todd just flipped those switches. Hopefully with the dispatcher's permission. That one track to the left of the mains is my version of Milepost Yard, which was at Milepost 31. And it's the place where the westbound freights would set out their Everett and North cars before proceeding into Seattle. Very good of Todd to return the switches to the main route. All we have to do now is get the crew in the caboose to back us up the hill. Normally on the prototype, the jet job starts in Bayside, runs and works the Boeing plant, and returns to Bayside. On this model railroad, we do it the opposite way uh, because it makes the job a lot more fun and it keeps the cars easy to move from this hidden track. 
because this hidden track also doubles as a continuous run connection for when I'm not doing an operating session. Headlight off. Well, there's one last thing to do. Can you guess what it is? Oh, yes, the car cards. Put them away in the car card box. Well done, Todd. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this part 14 of my continuing model railroad operations video series on the Burlington Northern in the Seattle area, set in approximately 1973. I welcome you to watch all the other videos that I've done, as well as the ones I plan for the future. In the meantime, if you're interested in this topic of moving aircraft parts to the Boeing plants, check out these new books by Andrew Klomkla, uh, and I've got his website posted here. He's done a lot of research, and there's quite a bit to learn about both the skybox cars that we've run today, as well as the fuselage parts and eventually complete fuselages that were shipped from Kansas all the way to the Boeing factories in the Seattle area. So for now, this is Burr Stewart wishing you much fun with trains. <laughs>